Hello and welcome to the good old days of radio show. This is John Tefteller, your host, and we are counting down the top 10 stories written by the greatest female writer of all radio, Miss Lucille Fletcher, the first lady of radio strangeness and horror. As I've said on previous shows, there weren't many female radio writers, but Lucille Fletcher was the best. And since this is our Thursday show where we tend to feature the weird and the strange and the unusual, we're doing a series of 10 stories by Lucille Fletcher, and we are up to number six, a, another really great one, Fugue in C Minor with Ida Lupino and Vincent Price. And of course, Vincent Price is known... <laughs> worldwide by fans of horror films for all kinds of great roles, and he had a great voice for radio and did a lot of radio. And we have, again, our special guest, Don Ramlow, who knew Lucille Fletcher uh, in her later years. Uh, Don, what, if anything, do uh, did you talk with Miss Fletcher about Fugue in C minor? We talked only a very little bit, and what I did is I asked her, her thoughts on being able to have a script performed by Vincent Price. And she indicated to me she was really thrilled because, as you indicated just a, a second ago, she really felt he had that voice designed to have that underlying tension and stress and horror that he became so known for. So she thought it was just a wonderful uh, opportunity to have him work on this particular script. And then you had Ida Lupino into it, who was very much a talented actress in her own way, and later he went on to become a very famous director, uh, one of the few women directors that were out there. That was quite a combination to put together on her show. Yeah, well, this one, Fugue in C Minor, I heard this first about 40 years ago when I was uh, working at Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters and messing around with the transcription discs there. And uh, I borrowed a little stack of suspense shows and brought them home, and I put on this thing, Fugue in C minor, and I thought, okay, this might be interesting. It's It's got Vincent Price in it. it, it I didn't know at the time it was written by Lucille Fletcher until I listened to it. Right. But it did say on the sleeve, it said Fugue in C minor starring Vincent Price. And I put this thing on, and I'm listening to it, and it just sucked me right in. And I thought, what a great, great story and what great, great writing. And then when I found out at the end it was Lucille Fletcher, I thought, wow, Sorry, Wrong Number, Fugue and C. Reiner, Diary of Sophronia Winters. This woman could write, and this woman could really understand how to grab an audience and hold them till the very end. I agree with you. I mean, that was just a wonderful, and this is another very intense script, again, for the people. And the fact that she brought children into this, which she didn't do in many of her scripts, just kind of, I think, added another layer of intensity onto the production yourself, worried for those kids. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you another quick little anecdote here. I played this for my children when they were <laughs> very young, and they were really freaked out by this story. And then I played it for them again about six months ago, and they didn't remember hearing it when they were very young, but mm -hmm. boy, did they like it recently. The, my, my son said, well, that was really good. <laughs> so <laughs> this will appeal to all kinds of audiences. So you people listening to this, if you have younger people in your household, I wouldn't play this for a six-year-old, but if you've got them like 10 and up, uh, bring, them, bring them in and, and let them listen to this because I think it's going to hold their attention quite well. This is Fugue in C Minor starring Vincent Price and Ida Lupino from June 1st, 1944. Roma Wines presents Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. The Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, welcomes you again to this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight, from Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you as stars Miss Ida Lupino, currently being seen in Warner Brothers' In Our Time, and Mr. Vincent Price of 20th Century Fox, 
soon to be seen in the Daryl F. Zanuck production, Wilson. For the appearance of these two distinguished screen personalities, Lucille Fletcher has written a suspense play that deals with brooding anxiety and sharpening suspicion played against the severe and forbidding background of the late Victorian era. And so with Fugue in C minor and with the performances of Ida Lupino and Vincent Price, we again hope to keep you in suspense. April 1st, 1900. Dear Bessie, this is just to let you know that I've arrived in Pilotsville. Lizzie met me at the station. Of course, she is heartbroken about Papa's bankruptcy and for some reason feels that it's up to me to remedy the family situation. I told her I'd been offered a job, but she swept that idea away in horror. A girl with your looks, Amanda Peabody, doesn't have to get a job. There are too many rich husbands floating around for that. Furthermore, she says, she has a rich husband already picked out for me right here in Pilotsville. Don't you remember? I told you about him at Christmas time. He's a Mr. Evans, rich as Croesus, charming, cultured, a lonely widower with two dear little children. And besides that, he's just your type, a real intellectual. You should hear him play the pipe organ. And well, Bessie, I've met so few interesting men lately. And all you'd have to do is lift your little finger. Evans. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Chumley. How delightful to see you here. I'd like you to meet my sister, Mr. Evans, my sister, Amanda Peabody. Delighted, I'm sure. It's a lovely party, Miss Evans. Oh, thank you, Miss Peabody. Have you just come to Pilotsville? Yes. She's down from New York visiting me after the whirl of the hectic social season. Oh, indeed. <laughs> but I'm afraid our Pilotsville society must seem a bit dull to you, Miss Peabody. Oh, no, not at all. It's charming. I've enjoyed everything so much tonight. Your beautiful house and the music... I hear you're going to play for us, Mr. Evans. Oh, a bit. Do you care for organ music, Miss Peabody? Oh, yes, very much. I never miss a church recital. But what a luxury it must be to have your own pipe organ right here in the house. I'm afraid I couldn't do without it. It's my hobby, you know. Bach and Buxtehude, César Franck. Don't you adore their works? Uh, Amanda's very musical. You should hear her render the burning of Rome. Oh, uh, yes. And the delightful thing, of course, about having a pipe organ in the house is that it's everywhere. To sit at the keyboard and hear the walls, the ceilings, the floors vibrate. You see, Miss Peabody, I've had the pipes installed all over the house. Under this floor, for example, are all the choir stops. Up in the bedroom walls are the stops for the swell manual. The great 32-foot pedal stops, the giant diapasons, are underneath this staircase. My children sleep next door to the echo chamber. So you see, we live like angels here in a paradise of music. How thrilling. Oh, ladies, come upstairs to the second floor landing, won't you? And I'll show you the console. It was made for me in Vienna. April 7th, 1900. Bessie, dear... To tell you the truth, I really find him fascinating. I wish you could hear him play. It sweeps you off your feet. There is such wildness to it, and at the same time, such dignity. And to hear the sound all through that marvelous house, rolling through those gorgeous rooms with their beautiful tapestries and potted palms, I could listen to him all night. You have the most amazing eyes, Miss Peabody. What are you thinking about? The music. Oh, please don't stop. It's so beautiful. Well, you seem to be as mad about music as I am. Your sister says you play, too. Oh, no, only a little. My appreciation of it is all inside, I'm afraid. Well, that's plenty. If one can't play, it's better just to enjoy the music of others. I can't bear this sentimental drumming. Can you? I shouldn't think you would enjoy it. The idiotic tunes people play nowadays. Give me the old stern classics. They have strength and power. Give me something with life to it, something that will flood the whole house with sound. Oh, that 
that's marvelous. You're a very unusual girl, Miss Peabody. Quite unlike the run of girls we have down here in Pilotsville. Yes, in what way? Oh, it's rather hard to explain. Uh, won't you have some more tea, Amanda? No, thank you. A muffin. Oh, yes, thank you. You have an excellent cook, Mr. Evans. Please, call me Theodore. You know you promised. Theodore? Amanda. Your house is beautifully run, too. You must have an excellent housekeeper. Everything is always so charming and quiet. I haven't even heard a peep out of your children. My children? Oh, yes, the children. They've been away at school. You have two, haven't yes, you? Yes, Daphne and David. What sweet names. Ordinarily, I don't approve of schools for young children, but they were rather overwrought. You see, after Mrs. Evans passed on... Oh, I, I can well understand. Well, they were almost morbidly devoted to their mother, and then, of course, the unfortunate circumstances of her death. But I suppose your sister, Mrs. Chumley, has told you all about that. Well, no, not very much, except your wife was killed in a street accident, wasn't she? Yes, in Philadelphia. A brewery wagon and four horses ran her down. Oh, how terrible. Something I don't like to think about very often. Poor, beautiful Margaret. Well, it's like a nightmare, Amanda, and I still can't feel reconciled. But what I was driving at, the children, they were in school when she died, and by some malicious stroke of fate, there was an epidemic of scarlet fever raging up there. The authorities wouldn't lift the quarantine to let them out for her funeral. Poor little things. It upset them dreadfully. In fact, I sometimes fear it's left a mark on them which may endure all their lives. Why, what do you mean? They suffer from delusions. Delusions about her. They think that in some way she is linked... Her soul is imprisoned in the organ pipes. How terrible. I wish I could do something about it. It's a frightful notion. But they don't want me to play when they're home... That echo chamber in particular, next door to their bedroom. Yes? Well, you know, it's nothing but an empty sealed room with a few wires. Of course, it's all because they never saw her dead. But they have a notion she's, well, somehow hidden there. How ghastly. They really think that, do they? Children can think up such very strange things in their little minds. Can't they? <laughs> Tonight, for suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as stars Miss Ida Lupino and Mr. Vincent Price, whom you have heard in the prologue to Fugue in C Minor. Tonight's tale of suspense. Let us look in on another scene for a moment. A smart dinner party at the internationally famous Hotel Nacional de Cuba in Havana. One of the guests, a world-traveled American, sets down his wine glass and remarks that a truly fine wine always carries the unmistakable flavor of the particular vineyards from which it comes. Well, then, laughs his Cuban host, you must be homesick for California right now, for the wine you are enjoying so much is from America, from California. It is Roma wine. Yes, it's true. Our own wonderful vineyard country in California produces in Roma wines that discriminating people in other lands esteem as an imported delicacy. Yet you here at home can enjoy these distinguished Roma wines for mere pennies a glassful. You pay none of the expensive overseas shipping charges and duties. Daily with your meals or when entertaining or any time, you can delight yourself with the wonderful flavor that comes from age-old winemaking traditions perfected by modern quality controls and tests. Yes, only pennies a glassful for a treat you are certain to enjoy. For remember, Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. Roma, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Ida Lupino as Amanda Peabody and Vincent Price as Theodore Evans in Fugue in C Minor. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! April 18th. I met the children today, Bessie, for the first time. It was a shock. 
They're strange little creatures. Utterly unlike their father, the girl is about 11 and the boy 8. They were both dressed in deep mourning. Their large grey eyes seemed strained with terror. And they listened and trembled at every sound. This is Miss Peabody, children. She's a very good friend of mine. Now I want you both to shake hands with her. Well, come now, Daphne. You can at least tell Miss Peabody how old you are. Oh, no. Please don't press her. I know when I was a little girl, I hated people to talk about my age. I'd much rather hear about, well, about school. We're not going back there, no matter what anybody says. David. Oh, that's all right. Then you didn't like school? No. And Mama didn't like it either. She cried when we went away. Oh, but your mama wanted you to be educated, didn't she? She wanted you to grow up and be intelligent people, didn't she? Well, didn't she, Daphne? Who are you? You may call me Aunt Amanda. I'm a friend of your papa's. Do you know where my mama is? Your mama? Well, your mama's in heaven, dear. No, she's not. Then where is she, dear? Don't start them off again, Amanda, please. It's too upsetting. Now, come along, children. We're going to have a little music now, like old times. Do you remember when your mother was alive, we all used to play together? David, you with your cornet, and Daphne at the violin, and Mama at the piano. Well, Miss Peabody plays the piano, too, and she's promised to play Narcissus, Mama's favorite piece. Well? Perhaps some other time, Theodore, when they don't feel so strange. I tell you, I've humored them to death, Amanda. Now, come, David. There's your cornet on the mantelpiece, and Daphne... No! I insist. Now, look. I'll start the melody on the organ. David, you come in with your cornet obligato in the third measure. Daphne, you can follow me. What's that? Now, come along, children. What's that note? That note making that funny noise. What note? Oh, you mean that. Oh, that's just a cipher. A wire must have stuck somewhere, or one of the pipe valves. It's Mama. That's where Mama is. She's calling for oh, us. Oh, don't be silly. I'll just hit the key a few times and it'll stop. You've heard these ciphers before, haven't you, Miss Peabody? Well, I don't know much about pipe organs. It's a common technical occurrence, but very annoying, of course. What is she doing in there? Why doesn't it stop? That's where she is. She's in the pipe and she can't get out. Daphne, stop that nonsense. Oh, hush, dear. Your papa will fix it. No, he won't. He can't. She won't let him because he killed her. Daphne, what did you say? Oh, she she didn't mean it, I'm sure. The poor little thing's hysterical. We should never have tried to persuade oh, them, Amanda, Theodore. Just because they never looked upon her face, because they never saw her lying there in the coffin. Oh, hush, hush. Oh, to think that my own children should believe that I am a murderer. Theodore, you're As making them both I, sick. I, who loved their mother so much, who was so devoted for 12 years, do I look like a murderer, Amanda? Do I? No. There it is again. It's Mama. It's Mama. Oh, hush, dear. I'll take them upstairs for you, Theodore, while you try and fix it. <laughs> April 24th. Oh, Bessie, those poor little children. We took them out to the cemetery today to show them her grave. A marble angel guarded it. It was planted with pure white tulips. How final it was and peaceful. And yet, they began to tremble again the moment we set foot inside the house. Poor Theodore. A man is nearly out of his mind. What can he do? I keep asking myself that question. What can he do? She died in Philadelphia, you say? Yes, on May 15th. Just a little less than a year ago. And you weren't with her? No, no. She went there to take a piano lesson. There was this new teacher she'd heard about. She was always so self-conscious about her technique. But she never reached his studio. They notified me at midnight from the city morgue. And no one in Philadelphia saw her? No one, except the attendants at the morgue, of course, and the people who picked her up after the collision. It, it was such a brutal accident. But there'd be no one from among them who could speak to the children, explain to them. Oh, no. Oh, it's all too horrible. So sordid. I know, my dear, I hate to make you suffer, but if we could find some way, if they could just believe... When you brought her back here to Pilotsville, there was a funeral. Yes. 
And was there anybody then who saw her? No, I couldn't bear it. I, I didn't think at the time she'd been so beautiful. Her lovely, sweet, gentle face and her eyes. The horses had completely trammeled. Oh. Even if the children had been able to come home, I, I wouldn't have let them look. The coffin was sealed when I left Philadelphia. I didn't want to see her again myself. But there was a funeral. People came. There were flowers, an undertaker. Yes. Well, if they could believe that. If there was one witness. Perhaps Lizzie, my own sister. Funeral, Amanda? Of course there was a funeral. The finest funeral in town. A snow-white hearse and 25 coaches. Everybody sent flowers. The casket wasn't opened, but I've been to lots of funerals where they don't open the casket. And from what I understand, she was pretty badly mangled. But it was a beautiful funeral. Mr. Evans played the organ himself. The finest selections. All the sweet old pieces his wife liked. There was Narcissus and Mighty Like a Rose... And goodbye forever. Well, that's the way it was. So you see, David, my sister, Mrs. Chumley, was there. Yes. But how did she know it was Mama? Oh, David. She didn't see Mama, did she? Well, nobody saw your poor Mama, dear. She wouldn't have wanted anyone to see her. Mama wasn't there. She talks to us every night. She tells us to look for her. Where, dear? In the pipes. But, David, your mama's dead. She's been dead for nearly a year. You saw her grave out in the cemetery. Now, she's happy and at rest. Oh, why doesn't Papa give us the key? If he'd only give us the key, we could go and look for her. What key, dear? The key to the pipes. There's a little door just underneath the stairs. That's where the big pipes are. And inside, it's all dark. There, there are tunnels in there. And little rooms that go all through the house. And that's where Mama is. That's where she's hiding. Oh, David, darling, come here. No, I hate you. But why do you hate me? Why don't you let me help you? Because... Because what? Because you like him. Him? Papa, you're going to marry him, aren't you? Why, David... Yes, you are. Daphne says you are. You're going to marry him, and then we'll be sent back to school, and there'll be no one left to help Mama. Poor Mama will never be let out. Oh, I hate you. I hate you. David. David, what are you doing here? Did you strike Miss Peabody? He's sick, Theodore. I'm sure he's very Go sick. Go to your room at once. Oh, those dreadful children. Amanda, I tell you, they'll ruin whatever happiness we might have. Theodore. Theodore, I love you very much. But I couldn't marry you. Not with that child's cry ringing in my head. We've got to help them. Give them that key. Let them go and look in the room where the pipes are. Then they'll see for themselves that there's no ghost. Key? Who told you about a key to that room? Why, the children. The children. Amanda, I'm going to tell you something, something I've never told to a living soul. It may frighten you. Yes? Margaret was going mad when she died. Oh. No one knew it but me. It ran in her family. I discovered it long after we were married, after the children were born. Otherwise, I'd never... And now you think the children? Yes, I'm afraid so. It was peopling of sound she had, just like them. A fear of the dead's returning. She used to play... What's that? Why, it sounds like the organ. But the motor isn't on. The console was locked when I left. Well, someone's trying to play. No one but me can touch that instrument. It's forbidden in this house. And the servants are out. Unless those children... Come upstairs, Amanda. Theodore, open that door. Go in there and see what's happening, please. No. Theodore! I won't give in. I won't be a prey to it, do you hear? I, I won't, I won't, I won't! There. There, it stopped now. Yes. It was probably nothing but the wind. Theodore, give me that key. I'm not afraid. Are you saying that I am? I don't know. But I'll be fair with you, Theodore. I couldn't marry you and live here with that any more than your children can. What do you mean by Rip that? Rip out those pipes. Rip out the whole pipe organ. Give it to a church, but don't Get keep it here. Of the pipe yes, organ. it's not I worth it. I couldn't. The whole house was built around it, Amanda. It's been the very soul and spirit of this home. It's been the curse, you mean. Theodore, I know I'd go mad too if I had to listen to it night and day. It's so hollow. To think of those pipes so huge down there in the darkness. Why, I'd begin to hear things too. Theodore! Quiet, be quiet. Come outside. 
No, no, no. Give me the key. Give me the key. Miracle, Amanda. I'm sorry I've overburdened you. Well, why don't you want to go in there? Is it because you know something? You did something. What do you mean? Did you kill her? Amanda. Theodore. Very well, Amanda. Here's the key. If that's the way you trust me, we'll go down there and look around together. Come, Amanda. I'm sorry, Theodore. It slipped out. It was a dreadful thing to say. It's all right, I understand. Yet it hurts a little. I've trusted you so completely, Amanda. Oh, Theodore. Yes, Amanda. Let's not go in there. I do trust you, darling. I believe everything you've told me. No. This little key. To think it should mean so much. Oh. How black it is. Yes, pitch black. And cold. Where are the pipes? I, I can't see them. Come in further. You'll see them as soon as your eyes grow accustomed to the darkness. The biggest pipes pack this well under the great staircase like giants. Yes, I, I'm beginning to see them now. But shouldn't we go and get a candle? Let's go in a little further. Now, be careful. The floor is a maze of wires. Now, stand there for a second. Theodore! Theodore, don't leave oh, me. I won't be long. I thought you said you weren't afraid. I'm not. It's only... Theodore, where are you going? Just upstairs to play for you. Oh, Theodore! I'd like you to hear how the music sounds in the darkness. It's quite an experience being so close to the pipes. You know, narrow, suffocating, especially when I play the great Passacaglia and the fugue of Bach. Oh, Theodore, please, so I don't want to stay here. one of the here. Rheinberger symphonies no. or the great chorales of César Franck. Margaret, of course, but preferred Narcissus. Margaret! You're very gullible, Amanda. Then you did kill her. You killed her in this room. And, and you're going to kill me? Yes, simple, isn't it? But why? Why? I don't know. One gets tired every now and then of mere music. Sometimes oh. the classics demand competition. A scream, for example. There's something so exciting about pulling out all the stops and drowning out all human sound. Have you ever tried to match your voice, Miss Peabody, against the thunderous voice of Bach? It's most effective. And then when the struggle gets weaker and the air is almost gone and you choke and gasp for breath to bring the music down softer, softer. Theodore, you're mad. Oh, you're God, mad. Amanda, would you deny me that pleasure? No, help. I promise help. you the concert won't be too long. It takes about eight hours before the air gives out. But you know, I can play for days. And don't worry about the children. I think you've convinced them about the ghosts. What's that? Theodore. Someone shut the door. It's locked and the key is outside. Who's there? Let me out. Let me out. Theodore. Get away from me. Let me out to you here. Let me out. Let me out. I can't breathe. I'm suffocating. It's so dark. I can't breathe. Let me out. Please. Please. I can't breathe. I can't. Oh, no. No, don't. I can't. I can't. Let me out. I can't breathe. I... <laughs> Theodore. Theodore. Let me out. Let me out. He's dead. He's dead. Daphne. David, where are you? Oh, please open the door. Help me. Help me. Oh, no, no. Oh, no. <laughs> May 1st, 1900. I shall be coming home in a few days, Bessie. But I still can't sleep at night. I can still hear that laughter. Still hear that cornet playing its unearthly music. And Theodore Evans once more lies dead at my feet. It was his heart. He died of fright. In those few moments, he anticipated the hideous fate he had meted out to so many. And I might have died there, too, if he had not gone so quickly. But the children hated me. They wanted to kill us both. Those terrible, pathetic children. What horrors they must have sensed in that charnel house. There were other women besides his wife. The police found them all, buried and stuffed away into unused parts of the pipe organ. 
Bessie, I was in that pipe room alone with him for four hours before that door creaked open. There they stood, and I shall never forget their faces or the things they said. All right, Miss Peabody. You can come out now if you're really sorry. I'm sorry. Are you sure he's quite dead? Yes, he's dead. We were right all the time, weren't we, Miss Peabody? Yes, you were right. Now, will you come and help us find Mama? <laughs> So closes Fugue in C Minor, starring Miss Ida Lupino and Vincent Price. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Of all the rich treasures man gets from the earth and Mother Nature, none has been more highly esteemed than wine, good, delicious wine. And if you are one who does not yet know how much and how delightfully Roma wines add to your meals, well, let me urge you not to miss out any longer on such a treat as this. There's nothing complicated about it. Just get and serve Roma wine with any meal or any time in any kind of glass you wish. Serve it chilled. Try the many different kinds of Roma wine until you find those you like best of all. Try Roma California Sherry with its wonderful nut-like flavor as an appetizer or ruby red Roma Burgundy, or the deliciously delicate flavored Roma Sauterne. These superb wines cost you only pennies a glassful, yet they make even the simplest meal taste like a million dollars. Get some today, and if your dealer is temporarily out of Roma, please try again soon. You owe it to yourself to have and regularly enjoy R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines, made in California, for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Ida Lupino. Mr. Spear has just been telling me a little about next week's suspense show. The stars will be Thomas Mitchell and Donald Crisp in a story about a man who had headaches, tried everything to cure them, finally went to a psychiatrist and found out that he was a murderer. That certainly sounds like a broadcast we listeners won't want to miss. One more word. Please don't forget to buy that war bond this week. Next Monday, same time, you will hear Thomas Mitchell and Donald Crisp in... Suspense! Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Okay, uh, Fugue in C Minor from Suspense, June 1st, 1944. A masterful piece of writing. I can't really decide if I like that one better or Sorry Wrong Number. Sorry Wrong Number is probably the better story overall, but this one is the creepier story, so I think I like this one. Don Ramlo, friend of Lucille Fletcher in later years. Uh, any more on this particular show from you? Uh, not in this particular case. I thought it was interesting that really what you got into was that the villain was a serial killer, no less. I mean, so that was pretty intense, you know, part of the story. Uh, it was interesting to note that uh, John McIntyre, who many may know from so much radio work over the years, uh, and also Wagon Train, was the man in black. And then B. Benadera, uh played a modest role in the show, and she, of course, many people remember from Petticoat Junction. Do we know who played the children on this one? I don't. I don't, and I, uh, it's suspected. I can't confirm it. I've got two names in front of me, but uh, no one's been able to totally verify. But Mary Lou Harrington and Tommy Cook uh, hmm. are the two people listed as the child actors, but uh, that's not totally confirmed. Tommy, of course, is still with us. and Yeah, well, he would actor. know. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, he's an active member, of course, of Spurvac. Yeah, I think that would be a good idea to to find out if he was one of the children on that show because uh, Tommy's a really nice guy. So yes, he is. Yeah, the, the serial killer thing. Yeah, you don't get that till the very end. You keep thinking that, it, <laughs> that it's just the wife that he's stuffed in the pipes, but exactly <laughs> you find out he's stuffed multiple women in those pipes. Boy. <laughs> The 1940s version of Jeffrey Dahmer, Vin- Vincent Price. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so with that said, I think this is a wonderful show, and I'm looking forward to what we're going to be looking at in future weeks. Okay, well, we've got four more shows in this series, to a salute to Lu- Lucille Fletcher, and we will be back next Thursday with the next one, and on Tuesday with Drama, Variety, and Comedy, And Don Ramlow will be back with us for the rest of the series. And we hope to be able to feature at the very end some actual audio of Lucille Fletcher herself. So we we hope we can make that happen. We're working on it. All right. Thanks to everybody who listens. And thanks to Don for being on the show with me for this series and today. And we'll see you all next week. (laughs) 